Hi, Mary. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, thanks. I'm Sarah Posner, and this is The Posner Show, and my guest today is Mary Hunt. She is the co-founder and the co-director of the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual in Silver Spring, Maryland. She is a well-known feminist Catholic theologian, and uh, she's going to talk with me today about the new Pope, Pope Francis. And before we start, Mary, I just wanted to note that among your many other degrees, you do have a Master's in Divinity from a Jesuit seminary, and uh, that you've also spent time um, uh, teaching and working in Argentina. So I think that given, given your background, I'm confident that you're going to give us some unique and interesting insights into the new Pope. Um, so let's start with uh, the fact that he is the first Jesuit pope. Is there any significance to this in your mind? Well, the, the significance of that is that orders don't necessarily like to have their priests uh, become bishops or cardinals, mm -hmm. much less pope. So uh, this is the first time that there's been a Jesuit pope. And uh, it does set up a little bit of a problem in the sense that the Jesuits take a fourth vow, not just poverty, chastity, and obedience. But they actually actually also take a fourth vow of obedience to the Pope. So there's a bit of a theological conundrum here. How does one take a vow of obedience to oneself? Right. Um, I guess it makes you awfully obedient. I, I don't really know. But, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I so, think that's one of the problems that the, the theologians will puzzle over for centuries to come. How does right. one take a vow to oneself? So were you surprised when you heard who the, who the new Pope was? Yes. In fact, I was surprised. Um, but not for very long, because then mm -hmm. I began to put the pieces together, and it became okay. quite clear that I was mm -hmm. right in what I had said in my religion dispatches piece, uh, now what a week and a half or so ago, mm -hmm. when I said that the whole thing was done before they got there, and I think his election proves that. Well, you know, I think to the casual observer, they had, what, three, three four, five ballots? What there, was was one, there was one ballot on the first day, mm -hmm. and then there were four ballots on the second day, so right. the fifth ballot, exactly. So what makes you think that it was pretty much a done deal? I mean, he was the front, he was the, the runner-up, so was to speak, the, yes, to, he was, to he Benedict. Was the the, the runner-up to Benedict. And I think that the that showed that in this uh, this conclave, and the, the, the players had not changed all that appreciably in eight years, I think it shows that the basic trajectory toward what he is and how he is and how he is like Benedict and how Benedict is like John Paul uh, II uh, is quite clear, and, and that is to say that this is a very conservative, doctrinally very conservative gentleman who toes the church line on virtually every church issue. The one thing that he has distinguished himself about has been to suggest that women who have babies and bring the babies to be uh, baptized, even though the mothers are not married to the mm -hmm. fathers of the babies, he has said they should be able to be baptized. Now, in the 21st century, that, in my book, does not count for much. So, <laughs> right, because... You know, that, when you look at his track record on other issues, um, if you can see how clearly he parallels the uh, John Paul II, Benedict, now Francis, view of church. And if you watch his Mass this morning, and I don't know why I do these things, but I, I did watch his Mass this morning, uh, with the Cardinals, you can see that there's absolutely no deviation from the norm. A lot of uh, publicity is being given to his simplicity of lifestyle and his humbleness. But in fact, in the in the mass this morning, it was very interesting in the Sistine Chapel that the cardinals were seated in front of the grill. The people who were not cardinals were seated behind the grill when it came time for communion. The cardinals took the communion themselves. The lay people and other priests, presumably, who were behind the grill had to kneel on a kneeler and receive communion on their tongues. I mean, this is this is like something out of uh, the Middle Ages, in in terms of really American Catholicism, where people mm -hmm. walk up to communion and right. put their hands out and receive. So I, I don't mean to be too too uh, technical or in house mm -hmm. on this, but those are the kinds of things that show me as a theologian that um, one sees what one gets here, and uh, one gets what one sees, and and this is not altogether very different. And I think that was his appeal, and I think going into the conclave, knowing that they had somebody who could garner that many votes. Um, made it quite clear that, that they just need to persuade a few people, and that was that. The fact that, you know, that sort of the cherry on top is that he's from Latin America, so that right. looks different. And the other, you know, the sort of the second cherry is that he's a Jesuit, um, and that 
cuts both ways. So it, it's a it's a pretty um, as far as I can see, it's a it's a pretty uh, pretty done deal. It was a pretty done deal. Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I think it's not a surprise that they would have picked somebody who was very conservative and 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 um, doctrinally conservative and very conservative on issues of sex and gender. Um, it's not like anybody expected this group of cardinals to vote for somebody who didn't fall into that line. So obviously, there were a lot of candidates who met those criteria. Um, but one of the other things that a lot of people were talking about ahead of the conclave was that this new pope would need to deal with a lot of the corruption right. and the sex abuse scandal and some of these internal things at the Vatican that Benedict was kind of notoriously too scholarly or theologian-like to, to deal with all this bureaucratic stuff. Uh, and so, but why? But what's in what's in um, Francis's dossier that would have made him a logical choice for that reason? Well, I don't know if it's a logical choice, but he certainly was a good compromise choice because I think many people could feel comfortable with him. That is to say, people who and remember, this is all among conserv very conservative people, but mm -hmm. uh, the very uh, among very conservative people, they could feel confident that he would hold the line doctrinally. They could feel that so, so that the, the very the very right wing would be happy. The the more left wing of this very conservative crowd would also think that he, as a person who has almost no pastoral experience, but only administrative experience, would be able to do what needs to be done with the curia. And um, that is all the, that, that seems to be the major task at this point, which is to reform the curia. Now, remember that people like myself have no interest in these things because we think this is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And that right. in fact, <laughs> what needs to happen is that we need a, a new boat and or we need several boats and that we need a, a, a very different model of church. So I'm, I'm speculating here on the basis of things that I'm really not particularly interested in and don't think make a hill of beans of difference. But uh -huh. um, in fact, in, in fact, in terms of parsing it in a Catholic way, that's exactly what's going on is that, that, mm -hmm. that he pleased enough people on both sides to be able to get him through. He's also not a young man. He's probably not the healthiest pope that ever uh, he only has share. one lung. He has one lung. Uh, people apparently live quite well with one lung. But I think that the, the real issue is that this probably will not be a long pontificate, and that probably uh, helped people to, to make the choice. There might have even been a deal done that, you know, when he hits 80, he resigns like his predecessor did and uh, goes off to pasture in Castle Gandolfo, and then maybe we'll have three popes in the, in the Vatican at that point. So, you know, anything is, anything is possible. I also think the Latin American thing should not be played down. I think many people in Latin America are very pleased that there is a Latin American Pope. But Latin America is a very big place. And mm -hmm. Argentina, as you know from, from knowing my experience there, is, is a, a very unique place in Latin America, probably along with Uruguay, the most Europeanized. So someone suggested today that, in fact, he was an Italian who just happened by accident of birth to be born. Uh, well, his parents are Italian, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, but I think the, the, the fact is that, that, that he is a Latin American, that that shows that there is a trajectory toward the developing world. I mean, heaven forfend, there, there aren't, you know, all, all that many Catholics to make a quorum in most of Europe today. So uh, it's certainly a good business decision. And I think this is basically a business deal. You know, this is really how do you keep the uh, corporation going with uh, the, the best kind of, of leadership. Now, it doesn't mean the most robust kind of leadership, but somebody who will at least maintain the status quo. And I think um, this man can confidently be considered someone who will do that. So I'm, I'm of the mind that things will not change much anytime soon. Well, let's talk about Argentina a bit. You know, so in the United States, uh, it, it's, Catholics do not think uniformly on a lot of things uh, that the Vatican stands for. Um, birth control, homosexuality, women's ordination. I mean, there's a lot of diversity of opinion among American Catholics on those kinds of issues. Is that also true in Argentina? Absolutely. Among Argentinian Catholics. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Not as well organized as here, um, probably because of some of our tax laws and so forth that make it a little bit different, a little, little easier here to organize these things. But certainly among rank-and-file Catholics in Argentina, there is a wide variety of views on all of these issues. That's the case all over the world. Mm -hmm. the, there's also um, the, the, the long history in Argentina, which is probably the, the the most salient point about this gentleman, the, the, the long history of the involvement of the church with various governments. And 
uh, certainly during the dictatorship was the time that I lived in Argentina. I spent two years, 1980 and 1981, teaching at ICIDET, which is the uh, the school, the theological school of the Protestant churches, kind of like Union Seminary in New York. That would be mm -hmm. sometimes called Union Seminary in Buenos Aires. And right. I, was a, I was a visiting professor there for two years and uh, learned a lot, I must say. And that was during the so-called Dirty War. That was mm -hmm. 1980 and 81. And that was a time when um, this pope was, uh, this pope was at that point, uh, in the leadership of the Jesuits. And I belong to a group, we had a group at the seminary that was actually among seminary professors and theologians in the city, a, a group of, of people who favored human rights and who worked on human rights. And I had the privilege of being a part of that group. It met one month at our seminary, one month at the Jewish seminary. Um, the Jewish counterpart to our dean was, and you may know this name, Sarah, Rabbi Marshall Meyer. Mm -hmm. um, to whom t Jacob Timmerman dedicated his book, Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number. And um, uh, Marshall Meyer was a heroic person in the dealing with the uh, dictatorship in the Dirty War. There wasn't a Jesuit in our group, I'm sad to say. And I had just graduated from a Jesuit school in Berkeley. I'd done mm -hmm. a Master of Divinity with the Jesuits and then a doctorate with a Jesuit uh, advisor. And I was, was rather surprised then that there were no Jesuits in the in this group, and uh, very few Catholics, maybe one or two from our seminary faculty that was actually ecumenical. But uh, that, I think, is the answer to the question people want to ask about what did uh, Francis do when, what did Francis know when, in terms of the two Jesuit priests who were kidnapped right, um, right. in Argentina. And in fact, I, I don't think we have the data on that at this point, but I, I think it will turn out to be that it was more, uh, as it were, sins of omission, what he didn't do, or the Jesuitical, if you will, choice that he made uh, to work behind the scenes. And um, in those days, I had the privilege of being a volunteer in the office of Adolfo Pérez Esquivel, who was the Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, in 1980 for his work with the uh, Mothers of the Disappeared, Las Madres de Paso de Mayo, and with other groups that were working on human rights uh, abuses during that time. And um, Adolfo came out with a statement yesterday that was very interesting to me, saying that, in fact, um, when he was cardinal, the now Pope Francis was not involved in uh, helping the dictatorship. He, right. Adolfo said he knew other people who were involved, and this guy wasn't. And I have to say, I take Adolfo very seriously as a mm -hmm. source. So I think it's, it's pretty uh, clear that he wasn't among the worst. But... Did he distinguish himself as a human rights leader? Was he public in his uh, speaking out in favor of the mothers and grandmothers of the disappeared, uh, in fact, of the disappeared themselves? The answer to that is no. Right. You said that that was a Jesuitical position to take, to work behind the scenes. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, you know what the term Jesuitical means. It, it, it means a kind, of, uh, a kind of trickery or sleight of hand or things that are done rather like we would say like this, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you do your hand like this in Spanish, it means you know, you're sort of taking things. Jesuitical means very crafty, cunning. Uh, it's, it's not the most flattering word in the world, and there isn't an equivalent for Dominicans or Benedictines, so that tells you something. But something that's done in a Jesuitical way is to say that it's done uh, rather craftily with a certain cunning, and I think that there are certainly, there's certainly evidence that um, the cardinal at that point, who was the provincial of the Jesuits, uh, figured out a way so that he, rather than another priest, would celebrate the Eucharist in the home of one of the generals or the church of one of the generals and have an opportunity to press for the release of these kidnapped priests. But uh, that's kind of behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. In front of, you know, in the, in the foreground, what, you, what you're dealing with is of someone who, as a Latin American, as a theologian, and as a Jesuit, opposed and continues to oppose liberation theology. And uh, he opposed the participation of priests and members of his community. I assume that means seminarians and brothers as well. He opposed their working in base communities. Now, that's what people in the 70s and 80s did in Latin America to try to be helpful to the poor. So um, people made poor, I should say. I don't like to talk about the poor, but people who are made poor by economic structures. So it's very hard to square up that kind of opposition to Latin American liberation theology, which in my mind was in, an, and I actually wrote a doctoral dissertation on feminist theology comparing it with Latin American liberation theology. So mm -hmm. I, I've read some of it. 
Um, but I, I tried, to, I, I, think, I, I think it's very hard to square that up with what was actually going on in his own country at the time. I think that's something we need to talk about, we need to think about, we need to get more evidence and uh, information about, and hope that maybe he learned from that that one has to handle things differently. By contrast, now, with a president who is much more liberal and progressive, in right. a country that has same-sex marriage and uh, so forth, he has seen, he's had no compunction about uh, raising his voice publicly in mm. the social and political arena to denounce, uh, certainly divorce in Argentina, which has been late in coming, to denounce abortion, and to denounce same-sex marriage in very graphic terms, very hurtful terms. Uh, right, so let's, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. So uh, recently, in the it was in the past year or two, right, that, that, that uh, same-sex marriage became legal in Argentina, and he led the opposition. That's Basically. right. He was the, the loyal opposition, as it were. But, <laughs> right. yeah, he, he led the opposition most unsuccessfully in the same way that people like um, uh, Archbishop Cor de Leon out in Oakland, who's now running the American strategy against same-sex marriage. They lose miserably. But you can see that the issue is not whether you win or lose, especially on those issues. The issue is how you prove your, how you get your spurs, how you show your bona fides, how you get the notch that says, oh, yes, I'm, or punch your ticket. This is, this is what I'm going to do. And I've written about this before with lots of people, uh, including people like Cardinal Whirl and, and others. Who's who the Archbishop of Washington, D.C. The, the, the Cardinal of Washington, right. Washington D.C., mm -hmm. that's right. And he, in fact, took himself out to Seattle. He was deputized in Seattle some years ago to help out in the case of Bishop Hunthausen, Archbishop Hunthausen, who was considered soft on issues of women and gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, and so forth. And uh, Mr. Quirrell was sent out there, and of course, he didn't succeed particularly well, and, and then ended up getting Pittsburgh as his reward. Um, but he showed that he was a loyal man of the of the company. And so it doesn't really matter whether you're the same with Cordelione. I predict that Mr. Cordelione will be cardinal uh, very soon. And uh, I think it's not whether he wins or loses with Maggie Gallagher on same-sex marriage, but whether he plays the game. And that's exactly what happened in Argentina. This guy mm -hmm, lost miserably. Mm -hmm. the, the president publicly rebuked him for talking about the fact that same-sex marriage was uh, connected with the father of lies, as he right. put it. El padre de las mentiras. I mean, what a thing to say. And then he went on to say that people like me who, um, who are same-sex loving people who adopt children or who have children of our own discriminate against our children. Very right. hard to imagine um, how, how we do that. But uh, <laughs> this is his view, and this is a very hurtful thing to say. This is a very yeah. true thing to say, and it's a very un unhelpful thing to say. And I hope, as Pope, he realizes that and uh, stops saying it because it's, so, it's absolutely wrong. I mean, it's, it's yeah. Uh, um, so, did he get any? Well, you said that because of the tax laws in Argentina, there's a little less organized opposition. You know, you don't have these nonprofits and advocacy groups and so on that you might in the United States of dissenting Catholics, you know, so here in the United States, there's a number of organizations that advocate for same-sex marriage, that sure. advocate for reproductive choice, that advocate for women's ordination and things like that, and had the Archbishop of wherever, I mean, and, and bishops in the United States have made, you know, comparably hurtful comments like that, and, and you'll get pushback from groups like that right. when something like that happens. Did that happen in Argentina? Yes. Or was his pushback yes, from people who were Catholic? Yes, there, there, are, there, there is, for example, a Catholics for Choice group in Argentina, mm -hmm. and they have been very good and very helpful and have had the resources of Catholics for Choice in all of Latin America, the Mexican office especially, and uh, some of the folks in Uruguay and Brazil have been very strong. So there's always pushback from them. Mm -hmm. And certainly around the same-sex marriage, there was pushback not only from Catholics, but also from a variety of Protestant groups who, who uh, themselves uh, were some, for example, the Lutherans were very progressive on this question relative mm -hmm. to the Catholics. So they've pushed back against the Catholics, but it's just not organized in the same way. And yet they won. And um, right. this is because they, their government uh, in some oh. ways pays less attention to the church than, than ours does, and uh, they don't have, I think, as high a concentration of very conservative Catholic legislators as we do in this country. You know, the oh, that's interesting. Types. And I think that, that those, that for that reason, uh, some of the opposition to the Catholic stuff is just washes over. They, they don't even, you don't even need to respond to them because they're not taken as seriously. And I think that's what happened on the same-sex marriage question. Uh-huh.
Interesting. I, I could be wrong about that. I mean, it'd be interesting to talk with some, some friends there. But people I know in Argentina who are part of the Methodist Church, Metropolitan Community Church, Lutherans, um, they were all over these, these questions. But um, some of their own leadership was uh, certainly the MCC, but the leadership of the Lutherans and some of the Methodists were so good on this mm -hmm. that um, the Catholics just they, they simply couldn't make it stick. The other thing mm -hmm. is a myth about Latin America, and certainly about Argentina, is that everybody's Catholic, and everybody's not Catholic. Right, right. And um, there's also a very strong progressive Jewish community in Buenos Aires. There, is, there are many evangelical churches, not just evangelical, as we say, of Protestant churches, but also of what we consider more uh, conservative evangelical churches. But I, I think that, that the Catholic Church has lost so much stature and lost so much during the Dirty War when the bishops did really? not stand up. They lost, they lost a lot of the stature that the Catholic bishops in this country have lost over sexual abuse. The Catholic bishops there already had lost over the war. Mm. The famous picture of the mothers of Pasa de Maggio going to the place where the bishops were having their retreat, and it was taken over the shoulder of one of the women and looking at the bishops, and the bishops were on one side of the fence and the women were on the other. And a more, te a more telling image one couldn't find of um, the church not standing with the people. So I get a little perplexed by this notion that this gentleman is on the side of the poor. I don't really know what that means exactly, especially poor women who need abortions or poor men who are gay or um, poor children who are abused. I, I don't know what it means to be on the side of the poor if in fact at the level of legislation and social cultural things you are not standing with people every day as we try to do uh, in this country and, and certainly other parts of the world. So I, those things yeah. haven't yet, I haven't yet been persuaded of that, but I, I, and just being Latin American doesn't make you stand on the side of the poor. I think that's one of the things we need to talk about, that there are, this man is not one of them, but there are many wealthy people in Latin America whose perspectives on these things are not particularly progressive, and um, there are people like this gentleman who come, actually comes from the middle class or even working class people who have not necessarily made the same kind of option. As, having said that, it's also true that living in Latin America uh, is a different experience for everyone, and so there is a, a way in which uh, he hopefully is touched by and affected by those things. But again, I, I don't want to go too far into this, Sarah, because I think it gets us off track of what's really at hand here, mm -hmm. which is that the big changes that we need in Catholicism are not going to come from him or any other pope. They're going to come from the ground up, from uh, new structures and new forms of governance. And that we have not only no evidence of, but to the contrary, we've now had two weeks of media saturation of a way of doing business, a way of being symbols and images that I think only reinforce and reinscribe all of that. So um, it's very difficult, I think, to, to be all that optimistic at this point. Well, one of the things that really struck me in a lot of the media coverage was this discussion of his... Um, there, there, there was sort of a, a, a meme that took root, which was that he very much cares about the poor, and there was this the photograph of him washing the feet of a, um, a patient at a hospital who had AIDS, and um, that you know he rode the bus and lived in an apartment and cooked his own meals and all of those things that all of us have heard um, in the past two days. Um, but I thought Marion Ronan made a really good point in the piece she did for RD, which was you know half. Half, you know, half the world's population are women, and right. you know, presumably roughly half, you know, of the world's poor are women, maybe even more. Um, and how are they not going to become less poor if you don't provide them with or don't allow them access to contraception and full reproductive health care? And you know, she, she she raised a number of other issues too. But to me, like it struck me that that his um, social justice values, as they were portrayed, were just taken at face value without, I, I felt like a lot of the coverage just sort of uh, celebrated his, um, com what was portrayed as his compassion for the poor, which he may indeed have, but this did not get translated in any way into, well, what would he do as Pope to actually do anything about this? Well, I hope he has compassion for the poor. I mean, how, you know, everyone should have compassion for the poor, but that's not the issue. The issue is how are people made poor and how are people kept poor? Mm -hmm. And to my mind, if, take the AIDS example. You know, the, the, the mythos now is that he went to a hospital and he washed the feet of 12 AIDS patients, asked for water, and could I wash their feet? So it's lovely, marvelous, symbols are important. Mm -hmm. But 
if you are in a position of responsibility and power, and especially in a religious system that has political power, that is the power to change how governments provide health care, and you say that people should not be able to use condoms, right? then you're surprised if people get HIV AIDS, <laughs> and your response to that is to go and wash their feet. Yeah. I think that's wholly inadequate. I think that's sort of the right. Mother Teresa approach, that Mother mm -hmm. Teresa was very much, and people who worked for her said the same thing, uh, maybe, if an, uh, maybe had her heart in the right place, but in terms of what it takes to eradicate poverty, what it takes to prevent disease, is very different than garden variety uh, Christian charity. It takes hard work, it takes solid analysis, and it takes courage to say, we did that for a long time and it didn't work. Now if we really have compassion for people who are poor, we will be sure that each and every one of them has access to the contraceptive uh, devices that they need, that each person has access to condoms as a barrier method to, uh, the, for the prevention of disease, and that we begin to put our energies and our focus not just on loving the poor, but in eradicating poverty so that people are not made poor anymore. That's what I want to see, and that's what I have not seen. And I, I, I must say I'm pessimistic about that, and, mm -hmm. and that's very disappointing. And I think you're right that the media, now they've only had 24, well, now they've had 28 hours right. to okay. deal with this. But, um, you know, it takes some time. I, that's why I haven't written anything yet, because I've been, been trying to sift through everything I can read uh, by way of background. My friends in Argentina have been sending me materials, and I'm really trying to piece it together with my own sense of, of Argentina, what it was like to be there, what it is like. I've been there a dozen times since I came home, but... It's it, it, to try to put myself in that mindset in order to say something analytically useful mm -hmm. about what could go on here. Right. Uh, not just to, to repeat or rehearse uh, bits of stories that we get told about someone, which are admittedly lovely, but, uh, you know, what do they amount to when it comes to actually doing the work that needs to be done in the 21st century? I'm not sure. Well, just to close out here, I mean, Ed, do you have any expectation then that in our lifetimes the Catholic How long are you gonna live Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, your lifetime? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, you know, uh, because it seems to me that the church as an institution doesn't seem to care that there are dissenting Catholics, that there are Catholics who um, are in disagreement with them on a host of issues, uh, principally uh, relating to sex, sex and sexuality. Yeah. Um, but do you have any, it seems like the more there's dissent among Catholics, the more the church just says, well, no, you know, we, we won't tolerate dissent. We'll send investigators to see about the nuns' radical feminist ideology. Yeah, it's quite laughable, isn't it? But yeah, this is, I mean, this is what will be very interesting, and this is where he, he is, in my mind, again, a, 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 a pivotal figure vis-a-vis um, -vis the question of does he really want what, what Cardinal Ratzinger uh, put out during the, the reign of John Paul II, which was really the first reign of Ratzinger. Ratzinger's really had two pontificates, in my view. <laughs> he has had his own, which he's completed by, re by resigning, and he had the second part of, of John Paul II's, where he really was effectively functioning as Pope. So we're, we're seeing some new administrative models here. Um, and he may have a third now. I mean, I, I, my view is that Ratzinger voted early and often in this election and that uh, he was very much a part of making this uh, selection of the person who was second to him the last time. That's, that's mm -hmm. my own view. I obviously wasn't there, but we'll see if history bears me out. Uh, I think the problem is that, 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 that what Ratzinger wanted was a leaner, meaner church. And it really doesn't matter if people who are progressive sort of peel off on the sides because the, the hard core of it stays the same. Um, that is something that I think has to change now. And I think the media has a very important role to play in that, which frankly and honestly most of them did not play in um, this papal transition time. I think we'll have another shot at this probably in um, five or ten years. But mm -hmm. um, I, uh, you know, I, I think that, that this kind of uncritical, fawning acceptance of things as they're, as they're presented does not help because there's no religious tradition, neither Judaism nor Islam nor even the whole World Council of Churches panoply of Protestantism that functions as an alternative religious worldview for the world. So what gets presented to the world is the Catholic patriarchal way of doing things. 
And with no opposition to that, and I didn't hear, and I saw a lot of coverage. I'm bleary-eyed from watching this stuff for the last two weeks. Right. I, I saw almost nobody from what I would consider progressive groups. I didn't see anybody from the SNAP group that works on sexual abuse. I didn't see anybody from the Women's Ordination Conference. I didn't see anybody from the gay and lesbian groups actually interviewed or, or brought in to comment on mainstream media. Right. Maureen Fiedler is the most progressive person, and she's been on the Diane Reem show, and she's done CBS Morning. Mm -hmm. and she's on as a journalist. She's a nun, but she's a journalist. Right. Maureen's done a marvelous job, but she would be the, the edgiest kind of person. None of the other people with whom I work have been brought in at all uh, in terms of media. I saw something that Matthew Fox did, um, but it wasn't mainstream by any means. So, so I think that's a, a real problem that we're up against. And, they, and the real story is not with the Pope, I think, but with the growing gathering groups of people who come from the Catholic tradition who are making various mature choices about their own spirituality. Mm -hmm. And many of those include going to other, going to other churches or uh, becoming so-called nuns that don't have any uh, religious affiliation any longer. N-O-N-E-S, right. N-O-N-E-S. Uh, some are becoming nuns, too, but I'd have to say that. <laughs> and some of the progressive nuns are just marvelous. But um, I think that's really where the story is. And it'll be interesting to see now that the numbers have tipped. We're really at a critical point on uh, homosexuality, on women's ordination, mm -hmm. on uh, abortion, choice, contraception in this country. But, you know, th this was a smart, again, Jesuitical move. Um, this gentleman is from the developing world, and uh, that's where the growth is. Right. So, um, you know, in the African churches and in some of the Latin American churches that are competing mightily against Pentecostal evangelical people, uh, this, is, this is really shoring up the base in places mm -hmm. where there are numbers. I think they've written off. I mean, I think John, I think Cardinal Ratzinger, now um, Pope Emeritus, uh, rather gave up on Europe. That was his, the signal of his pontificate was to really try to get Europe back in the fold. That failed miserably. Mm -hmm. But he, again, it, you just, it doesn't matter whether you, whether you win or lose for these guys. It's just that you show that you want to do it. Right. And, um, so I, I think that, that, that so, so do you have another European uh, Pope? Probably wasn't very good for business. And uh, this, this is certainly a good business move, no, no question about it. Well, listen, this was a really great discussion. I'm really glad we got, to, got a chance to do it. I'm glad we did, too, and I uh, wish you the best. And I'm so glad that Religion Dispatches does what it does, because uh, it really does provide a forum for, uh, I think, alternative and important and uh, increasingly powerful voices. So thanks for your work. Thanks, Mary. Okay, take care, Sarah.